One of the earliest descriptions of CPAP was called a pulmonary plush pressure machine. In 1936, when Poulton described using a Hoover vacuum cleaner to supply air at a positive pressure to treat patients with, he treated cardiac and bronchial asthma. He cautioned that the machine should be run for some minutes first to get rid of all the dust. The attention of this machine was not for sleep apnea as it is used today, but to help with heart and lung problems. They had discovered CPAP, but didn't even know it at the time. Colin Sullivan was born in 1945. He was trained as a physician in Sydney, Australia at the University of Sydney. He graduated in 1970. He completed his residency at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital and received a doctorate in physiology. Physiology was measuring variables such as blood pressure and airflow at the time. Colin then went to Canada and trained under Dr. Philipson, who had developed a model of measuring breathing and sleeping dogs. He then returned to Sydney and treated patients with respiratory failure and received the Cecile Lehman Mayer Research Award of the American College of Chest Physicians. This was awarded for original research on the influence of sleep on airway smooth muscle tone. Colin Sullivan looked for patients with sleep apnea. He wanted to experiment with them. They were hard to find at first. He couldn't find any at the beginning. He set up different models studying airway obstruction in animals and humans. The problem was how to measure airflow. They measured airflow by doing tracheostomy on dogs. He would occlude the airway and be able to test the airflow. At that time, he was creating masks for dogs. Sullivan's first five patients were booked in a hospital for a tracheotomy one night in 1979. This was the gold standard of treatment for obstructive sleep apnea at the time. Four out of the five patients did that procedure. One of the patients refused the tracheotomy but agreed to do Sullivan's CPAP experiment. Sullivan started this process at 9 p.m. that night and expected to be out of the lab no later than 11, as this would be a very short research experiment for him. He used a diving mask with medical grade silicone. As a patient was sleeping, the patient began to have apnea episodes right away, even with positive pressure. Sullivan experimented by using different pressures and noticed as he increased pressure, the apneas went away, and as he went down in pressure, that the apneas returned. This was the first official CPAP titration in history. Colin noted while the patient was sleeping that he went into a REM sleep as well. When the patient woke up, he told Sullivan that he felt alert for the first time in many years. What was supposed to be a two-hour experiment ended up going all night and would eventually lead to CPAP being the gold standard of treatment over a tracheotomy. A major hurdle that Sullivan encountered was creating a device for home use. They created a one-night therapy in the hospital, but now what? To make a CPAP machine, they had to put a circuit together something capable of giving adequate pressure to open the airway. Sullivan used a two-stage vacuum cleaner fan, set up in a box with a belt drive from an AC motor. Inlet and outlet tubes were separate from the motors, so if the motor burnt out, there would be no toxic gases going to the patient. Flow generator Hitachi Portex blower was a few hundred dollars and produces high flow and high pressure. The circuit had to be a very large pipe and a T-piece leaking most air to atmosphere. Fixed valve would leak pressure would be calculated for setting the pressures. The noise wasn't a problem with the patients as the initial setups were people who exhibited severe sleep apnea. It took a very long time to take this therapy seriously. This wasn't just the general population but the medical community itself. How could they take this seriously? You're using a vacuum cleaner fan and tubes. The drive came from the patients itself. These patients haven't been awake for years and they were feeling refreshed and rejuvenated for the first time. Why wouldn't they? They were suffering from severe hypoxia for so long. Another problem at the time was there was no suitable masks for humans yet as Sullivan was only manufacturing masks for dogs. There were a lot of masks for anesthesia but coming up with one for CPAP was the issue. None of the masks would create a pressure seal or be used for sleep overnight. Medical grade rapid sealing silicone was used to create the seal between the patient and mask. Sullivan eventually manufactured masks by taking casts of the nose. Sullivan and his patients thought that this would be a short-term treatment. 
They kept asking when they were going to have a cure, and Sullivan would keep telling them, maybe next year. Somehow it was thought by many that CPAP would train your airway muscles and brains to function normally after short-term use. For people who were overweight, Sullivan figured since CPAP would treat the metabolic problem that the patients would automatically lose weight and get off the device. He advised them to exercise as well. Sullivan's group followed patients around for five years and noticed the mean weight of the 100 patients stayed the same. By 1985, there were 100 people being treated on CPAP. Colin Sullivan and his team built all 100 machines and makes that were used in 1985. The masks lasted a long time made out of fiberglass and silicone. The silicone would peel off easily every morning and be ready to be used the following night. Colin eventually established a clinic and space in the hospital. He had to fight to get that space in the sleep lab. He was so busy making masks and machines that he recruited patients to help him out too in the manufacturing process. As stated earlier, Colin always believed that if the patients used this for a few months or less that they would be cured of sleep apnea. He thought the people could use it part-time too and it would be effective. For instance, you can use it during the week and take the weekends off. He called this pulse therapy. He eventually figured out that this wouldn't work and it would have to be a full-time therapy. Patients would get so attached to their machines though, they would want to bring it everywhere because of how great they felt using it. One of Sullivan's first patients tied a pink ribbon around their machine and called it Lulu. Colin Sullivan always strived to find out why people get sleep apnea. He believes that people get it early in life. The structure of the airway is key why people get it. Alcohol causes snoring and obstruction because it alters the tone in the airway. Colin believes that snoring vibration causes injury to that airway. It can start at an early age as a child and he believes that this leads to sleep apnea as vibration decreases tone in the airway. Snoring damages the nerve endings. It damages the blood vessels. No snoring is healthy. His focus has been on children. He believed in removing the tonsils and adenoids as a child may help throughout life in preventing sleep apnea. Crossbites and taking care of it on an early age, seeing an orthodontist is something to consider too. In the next 30 years, Colin believes CPAP will still be around just like reading glasses. He's amazed how far the technology has come with the machines and the masks.